It has been five years since the theatrical release of Joss Whedon's Justice League, but it's finally here, Zack Snyder's Justice League. And today is the day. It is time to compare the theatrically released Joss Whedon Justice League with the Snyder Cut. Let the battle commence. Now, in the opening of the Snyder Cut, Superman screams are traveling to the mother boxes across Themyscira, Atlantis, and Cyborg's home. And we have this super intense music playing, and we see Bruce Wayne traveling on a very long journey to find and recruit Aquaman. The opening of the Joss Whedon Justice League, on the other hand, starts out with some kids interviewing Superman when he was alive. It then cuts to Batman going after this random criminal. A parademon shows up. Batman pursues and traps it. It self-destructs somehow, and it conveniently leaves a diagram of three boxes behind. And the robber all of a sudden starts talking to Batman as if he wasn't committing any crimes. It's because they know he's dead, right? He's gone. Where does that leave us? And Batman just leaves him there as if he hasn't committed any crimes. We then cut to the intro with one of the worst use of pop songs I have ever heard. Everybody Knows plays, and the lyrics are so off kilter with the tone of the movie. Especially when the singer says, Everybody wants a box of chocolates. Did we just hear the lyrics, a box of frickin' chocolates in a Justice League movie? Seriously. In the Snyder version, the opening of the movie recaps what we just saw from the last movie, and it establishes the consequences and the tone for the rest of this movie, and it's very unsettling. And right from the opening logos, when you hear the new soundtrack, you feel like you are watching a very different movie, as the atmosphere is so unsettling and different from the theatrical version. So already the Joss Whedon version makes less sense. But it gets worse. Bruce comes looking for Aquaman, and for some reason, the mother boxes that are supposed to be these alien objects that very few people know of, have diagrams on the wall with Aquaman right next to them. Mother boxes have nothing to do with Aquaman. His people are guarding it, and that's it. This is just Whedon's second lazy attempt at explaining the mother boxes to us, the audience. In the Snyder version, we don't get that lazy mother box explanation. In fact, after we see Superman screams echo throughout the vicinity, the opening credits continue, and we see Bruce Wayne on a journey, and it turns out that the reason we see him with a beard is because he has spent weeks traveling to find Aquaman. In the Whedon version, however, we open with a criminal on the roof scene where he's clean shaven, we then cut to Bruce Wayne suddenly having a full grown beard, and then a scene later, he shaves his beard. So in a matter of three scenes, he goes from no beard, to full beard, to shaving his beard again. And this shows how much of a jumbled mess of a movie that Joss Whedon's Justice League is, that it can't even maintain some basic continuity. And then we get a new scene in the Snyder Cut where Bruce comes back to see Alfred and tells him that Aquaman said no. And I was so happy to see the scene in the Snyder Cut, because I always knew that something was missing from Justice League when Bruce Wayne came back from his visit to Aquaman. But we never saw it, we just cut to this. But in the Snyder Cut, we see him come back to Alfred, and this is where we find out that he has been away for weeks trying to find Aquaman. And this is just one example of how in the Snyder Cut, as well as getting more scenes and giving existing scenes time to breathe, you get context, such as why the mother box plot suddenly happened, what the mother boxes even are, what the mother boxes even do, the Snyder Cut tells you, and every time we get an explanation, something very significant happens that expands on the story as well as the characters. Even scenes that are exactly the same in both versions have much more weight and meaning in the Snyder Cut. For example, the scene where Bruce comes to see Barry Allen and asks if this is him, Barry just gives excuses left and right. Now in the Joss Whedon version, the two characters are just blurting out their dialogue and there's no weight to their conversation. The conversation of Bruce Wayne finding out Barry Allen's identity. In the Snyder Cut, however, when Bruce dissects and starts naming the specs of the Flash suit, Barry gives a look like, shit, he's figuring everything out. And there are actual reaction shots of Barry when he realizes that he's failing to divert Bruce's attention. Silica-based, sand quartz fabric. Brazian resistant, heat resistant. Uh, yeah, I do competitive ice dancing. Those reaction shots are nowhere to be found in the Joss Whedon version. Silica-based quartz sand fabric, abrasion resistant, heat resistant. Uh, yeah, I do competitive ice dancing. It just keeps cutting to him making excuses and jokes. You can actually see some intelligence from him in Snyder's version, and that although he's joking, he's actually taking this encounter seriously. So watching this scene, even though it is pretty much identical, there's more of a weight with Bruce Wayne and Barry Allen's first encounter. That weight was nowhere to be found with the same scene in the Joss Whedon version. So even though the Joss Whedon version has several more or less identical scenes from Snyder's version, watching them again in the Snyder Cut feels different, and they have a much bigger impact than they did in the theatrical cut. Also in the Snyder Cut, there is some calculated 
cat and mouse music going on in the background throughout this entire scene. In the Whedon version, there is a pop song in the background, then the music stops, and then Barry goes on about brunch, which is an obvious Joss Whedon addition. So I am using this scene as an example, but if you were hesitant like I was to watch the same Zack Snyder scenes again that we saw in the Joss Whedon version, rest assured they are handled much better in the Snyder cut, to the point that they take on a deeper and sometimes whole different meaning. And when you look at some of the scenes that Joss Whedon could have used, but instead decided to reshoot and alter, it honestly comes off like he thought the scenes that he wrote and shot were better than the originals from Zack Snyder. And they honestly aren't. Like brunch, like what is brunch? You wait in line for an hour for essentially lunch. He said that you were the thirstiest young woman he ever met. <laughs> Hungriest. That's the plan. Okay, we're not ready for racially charged. Wow, it's like a cave. I find it hard to understand why he refused to use the better scenes from Snyder and decided to go out of his way to substitute it with his scenes that were clearly inferior, and I can only assume it was down to his ego. And his ego makes no sense to me because he decides not to use this completed special effects shot of Flash saving hostages because he thought it was too confusing for audiences. I am not kidding. He actually thought that audiences were too dumb to understand this, but he did decide to give us this instead. Uh. Yeah, because it worked so well the first time you did it. I'm sure you could pick holes with the plot in Zack Snyder's version, but none of them were obvious to me. As far as I was concerned, everything made sense, and I didn't question the story or the characters' methods. Any questions I had, the characters addressed it and gave answers to them. And I gotta hand it to Zack Snyder. The script and his structure is something to be admired, and it moves along at a very nice pace, especially for a movie that's four hours. So the movie with the far superior story is Zack Snyder's Justice League. Now in Justice League, characters like Batman and Wonder Woman had elements of the characters they were in Batman vs Superman, but with Joss Whedon directing and writing scenes for them... Listen, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could uh, put out a, you know, a feeler or an aquatic... I mean, do you talk to fish? They are clearly very different people, as most of the time they either deliver exposition or tell jokes. And the jokes clearly don't represent what kind of characters they are. Oh, uh, yeah. Something is definitely bleeding. In the Snyder Cut, however, they do get to express what they are like as actual characters, and a perfect example of how different each hero is, is in the way they all greet Alfred for the first time. Alfred? Good day, Mom. It's badass, Alfred. Also, each of the characters have arcs, and they have epic conclusions to their arcs. This is especially the case for Flash and Cyborg. Barry has one with his dad, and Cyborg has one with his family and himself. And when Barry runs and says, Dad, whatever happens, I want you to know, your kid was one of them, Dad. One of the best of the best. I was actually welling up, and I was thinking to myself, how the hell am I welling up for Ezra Miller as The Flash? I have never liked his version of The Flash in these movies, yet here I am worrying that he might die with these last words to his father. That was a beautiful effect by the way, and it was very nicely incorporated into the story, and also sets up his future movies nicely. And when he was successfully reversing time, I was like, look at him run. Yeah, I know, I'm quoting Teen Titans Go, but I never thought I would be praising a Zack Snyder movie this much either, so there you go. And the music that played during this scene was tragic and inspirational and epic at the same time. And like I said, it almost made me well up. And the way Zack Snyder visualizes the Speed Force and the Flash of surroundings materializing as he travels back in time, top marks, really. It was beautiful to look at. And I honestly think that this is one of the best scenes of any comic book movie. And Joss Whedon gave us this instead. Dostoevsky! 
Yeah, he actually thought that this was better. A scene that gave Flash no character development, no conclusion to his story arc, and no scene of Flash saving the world. He just saves a dumb family and makes a dumb joke. Dad. Whatever happens, I want you to know. So as far as Barry is concerned in this scene, he's risking his life to do this. And this suddenly made me realize, hold on, he has a journey in this movie too. I didn't even know the movie was giving him an arc, but after he repeated his father's words to him, I realized he was having an arc throughout this entire film, and I didn't even know it. I want you to make your own future. You're living in the past. Make your own future. Make your own future. Make your own past. That's all. Right. Nah. He had a journey going from this when Bruce met him Stop right there. I'm in. To this. What a hero. As opposed to the Whedon version where he starts and ends the movie as the same person. And as soon as we have the conclusion to Barry's arc, we transition seamlessly into the conclusion for Cyborg's arc. And then we get Cyborg, a character that Joss Whedon did a complete disservice to. And he might as well have completely cut him out of the movie. Let me tell you, Cyborg is the emotional core of Justice League. And the scene that really got me was very early on where Victor cybernetically breaks into a bank and is surrounded by many wealthy bank accounts with stacks of money. And he suddenly focuses on this one very small account that belongs to a single mother working multiple jobs. And right when she's down to her last $11, he increases the money in her account. And when he sees how happy she is, he smiles for the first time in this movie. And that was a very beautiful moment. And this really sells you on Cyborg's character and shows you that he is a really nice person trapped in a tragic situation. And the music in this scene only further sells you on the pain and the tragedy that he is going through. And it's all done very well through visual storytelling. I never bought Cyborg as a member of the Justice League, not in any of the animated movies or any of the comic books. I was never convinced that he was worthy of being on the team. He just fits so perfectly with the Teen Titans. But this is the first time that I ever thought that he earned his place in the Justice League. He even has a scene where he learns how to fly. And all of this and more contributes to his absolutely wonderful arc. And in the Whedon version, we just get this. Couldn't do that last night. And it doesn't stop there. In the Snyder Cut, Aquaman and Wonder Woman talk about how Atlanteans and Amazonians hate each other, and they find common ground here and grow to respect one another. And he even offers her a drink in the end, which, coming from Aquaman, is a big compliment. Now in comparison, this is their bonding scene in Joss Whedon's version. You're gorgeous, and fierce, and strong, and mm. I know we went to war with the Amazons, but that was before my time. It's literally just a joke. No development. Why would Joss Whedon reshoot this and not just use this scene that Zack Snyder had already shot? It makes no sense. And I love the teamwork here. Like when they arrive at Star Labs to find the Superman ship and resurrect Superman. And Batman says to Cyborg, Victor, clear this place up. Done. <laughs> That is just so cool. And the following scene with Victor's father is also great. And there are severe consequences if the heroes try to revive Superman. The stakes are just so much bigger and more terrifying here. These stakes for waking Superman do not exist in the Whedon version. And in this scene, Cyborg sees the vision of the future where Wonder Woman is dead, Aquaman gets killed by Darkseid, and Lois is disintegrated into Superman's arms, and she's supposed to be pregnant with his unborn child. And then we see a future where Earth is conquered by Darkseid, and Superman is evil, and has killed all of the Justice League. And it's a terrifying visual, and it doesn't feel like cheap sequel baiting either. It actually feels like there are severe consequences to bringing someone back to life. You hear that, Marvel? And there's no cliched bullshit with Wonder Woman arguing with Batman about bringing Superman back. The team does have cold feet, but they very smartly come to the conclusion that there is no alternative. And watching them revive Superman was just so nerve-wracking and terrifying in the Snyder Cut. There was also tons of great humor in the movie as well, and me and my brothers were still laughing at some of the jokes several seconds after they were over, and I didn't expect that. And throughout this movie, I was constantly thinking to myself, how is this from Zack Snyder? The guy that gave us Man of Steel and Batman vs Superman. In comparison, they feel like movies that are made from a much less experienced filmmaker. There was also humour in the battles as well, such as when Cyborg couldn't use his arms to stop Superman and then resorts to wailing on him with his smaller hands. And it's funny, but the scene is still so dark and intimidating. With all of the jokes, the danger of the plot continues and the jokes don't meander or deprive the movie of tension. I'm sorry, you have a satellite? F6. 
So in the Snyder Cut, the heroes have far more personality to them, and they each come away feeling like much more fleshed out characters with a definitive arc. And granted, Joss Whedon didn't get the time to flesh them out, but with the time he did have, he decided to spend it with a Russian family and with dumb jokes rather than scenes where the characters could bond. So of course, the movie with the far superior heroes is the Snyder Cut. Now Steppenwolf, I mean, just look at his design in the Whedon version. And now look at his design in the Snyder version. Do I have to say more? And now listen to how in Whedon's version, Steppenwolf sounds. Where is my mother box? God, it sounds like he's just whining. And now listen to the way the line was directed in Snyder's version of Steppenwolf. And tell me, where is the mother box? Yeah, calling Joss Whedon Steppenwolf a cartoon character is an insult to cartoon characters. He comes out of nowhere, he constantly, and I mean constantly, monologues, and the only thing we know is that he wants these mother boxes to destroy or take over the world. And he only once says, For the unity! For Darkseid. But that's it. We don't know why he's doing this for Darkseid, or why he even has any investment in this at all. Now Zack Snyder's version of Steppenwolf, he is a much more fleshed out character with his own backstory, and it is mostly implied, but with just a scene or two, you understand his motivation for doing this, and why he wants to impress Darkseid, as he ultimately wants Darkseid to forgive him and let him return home and serve by his side. The unity will be formed. He will be pleased. He will see my worth again. So he is essentially going on a redemption story, and it gives him, Darkseid, and Desaad a history as well, so the villains don't feel like they suddenly exist when the movie starts. And to give what is essentially a henchman this kind of backstory is really quite impressive. And listen to how it sounds when he says for Darkseid. For Darkseid. He picks his moment when to say it, and because you understand his motivation, it doesn't sound like generic villain dialogue, like it did with Whedon's version. He also has this badass stare down with Wonder Woman where he tries to go for his axe before she can attack him, and then we transition into his first fight scene with the Justice League. And here's how the fight starts in Whedon's version. Yeah, a choppily edited mess. Now when Steppenwolf sets up camp for his mother boxes at an abandoned power plant, the Parademons tell him that this place is toxic. So it makes sense why Steppenwolf set up camp here. But he didn't count on Joss Whedon, as in his version, he had a family live here. And in general, Zack Snyder Steppenwolf speaks a lot less bullshit than Whedon's version. Like I said, Whedon's version just kept on monologuing and monologuing, and he wouldn't shut up. But Snyder's only really talked when he had a reason to talk. <sighs> You were born of her, a creature of chaos. Kill them both. <laughs> Amazon. And whenever he's around, he causes a lot of trouble for the Justice League, and it becomes apparent very quickly that without Superman, they cannot defeat him. And the more he succeeds at getting these mother boxes together, Darkseid is getting closer to conquering the Earth. And you really feel Darkseid's presence in this film. And with all the visions that Batman's been having and that we see from Cyborg in this movie, you really fear for that nightmare future. Something that I originally thought was just a cheap way of sequel baiting, but now I see is a great way for building up tension. Especially for the conquering the world plot point that we have seen so many times. It's actually a lot more scarier in this movie. Now something that I noticed is that this movie really builds up Darkseid. At first Steppenwolf requests to talk to him, but that never happens. Then later on in the movie, he actually has a meeting with him, and before he shows up on their alien Skype call, the Parademons all bow down, and then he materializes right in front of Steppenwolf. And we still don't see him properly at this point. We see flashbacks of him long ago in the past, as well as flashes of him later on, but it isn't until the end of the movie when the Mother Boxes synchronize and the Justice League lose, that we properly see him in all of his glory in present day. And the slow reveal was masterful in this movie. Additionally, Darkseid has a terrifying theme that accompanies him, and it really gives you this horrifying feeling of dread. So the movie that does a far superior job with the villains is the Snyder Cut. 
Now, all of the action scenes in Justice League were taken directly from Zack Snyder. There was one action scene that was added, and there was a couple of other tacked on elements to the final battle, but besides that, all of the action in the Whedon version is from Zack Snyder. And looking back at Whedon's action, you can just tell that he didn't know how to cut it together, and it doesn't hold a candle to the execution from Zack Snyder. And I also loved the extended battle between the gods and Darkseid, which is practically transformed in Snyder's version, and it's actually epic now. Also, in Whedon's version, they said it was Steppenwolf that the gods fought, whereas in the Snyder cut, it's Darkseid. And Darkseid does what any power-hungry villain would do. He actually makes an attempt to take a Green Lantern ring. He doesn't just watch and ignore it. I could also see why you needed the whole Justice League to come together and take Steppenwolf down in the Snyder version, because he would really hold his own when he would fight the League. Hence, the League had to bring Superman back to life to defeat him. And yeah, even when Superman is here, the tension is still there, as he does not equal an automatic win. Bad stuff can still happen, and bad stuff does happen. The characters lose, and they all die. Die. In the Whedon version, once Superman arrives, there is no tension left. And on top of that, the battle the characters have is a cakewalk compared to the Snyder cut. In Snyder's, each character has a big role to play during the climax. And when Superman does show up, he takes care of Steppenwolf and then they all gang up on him. And it was so awesome. And watching Wonder Woman smile made you feel happy that the characters are finally overpowering Steppenwolf. Although that happy moment is short-lived. In the Whedon version, Superman has a less cool entrance. And not only that, but he gives Steppenwolf a couple of hits. And then he leaves the team to save some civilians. But it's like, wait a minute, why are you leaving? The Justice League are still unable to defeat Steppenwolf. They still need you, you know, Superman. Well, that's all Joss Whedon, because in the Snyder version, once Superman shows up, he is here to stay, and he's with the team until the very end. Also, the stakes feel much more gigantic. In the climax, they are fighting for something big, whereas in the Whedon version, they are fighting for the same thing, but the stakes have been so poorly established that it feels small and insignificant. Like, yeah, who cares if they beat him or not? But here, you are really rooting for them to stop Steppenwolf and prevent Darkseid from invading. And I was shaking in my seat throughout the second half of this movie, especially the climactic action scene. There's just so much variety to the action scenes and the R rating definitely made it more entertaining. And it is glorious and yes, even epic. And you guys know how I don't use that word lightly. And this is especially helped by the amazing new Justice League theme. And you really feel the impact of watching the League work together as a team. And when Batman was almost killed by the Parademons, Wonder Woman saves him and he keeps driving to his destination by himself. And then suddenly the music ramps up and Cyborg and Flash show up by his side. That gave me so much chills and it made me smile. It was such an epic shot, and the message of teamwork came through so well, and it was just a beautifully put together scene. The same goes for the teamwork in the rest of the climax, whereas in the Whedon version, you can get Alfred to say this during the final action scene. This isn't the plan. No, Master Wayne. This is the team. But I don't buy it. This is not the team. This is the team. And this final action scene was so good that I wanted to revisit a couple parts of it before going to bed one night, and I ended up watching it all over again three times. This is honestly one of my most favorite action scenes in all of comic book movies. It just has so much layers to it, and it is a massive improvement over the climactic battle in Justice League. And I love when they send the head of Steppenwolf back to Darkseid, and they just stare at each other. All of them have now met for the first time. What a way to end the fight, as opposed to breaking Steppenwolf's axe and then saying, Do you recognize that smell? Fear. No! Leave me! That was just so pathetic in comparison. In Snyder's version, the first thing he does is break the axe, and then we have a whole battle to go, as well as a great finisher. The action, much like everything else in Justice League, is not even a shell of what it is in the Snyder Cut. So the movie with the far, far, far superior action is Zack Snyder's Justice League. Speaking of the conclusion, the conclusion for both versions end the characters in very different places and in very different ways. This scene doesn't seem so preposterous and sequel baity anymore, and I love the context behind this scene. He's dead. What? My father. His father's dead because of us. How do you go see my father? And off he goes to his awesome movie. 
Cyborg moves on and accepts who he is, completing his arc and furthering his character, and when you see how happy the Flash is that he fulfilled his father's wishes and has become one of the best of the best and now has friends, that actually made me happy. And the ending to the Snyder Cut feels like a much more earned and accomplished ending. The 2017 movie is not even a shell of what the Snyder Cut is, not even close. Even calling it a shell is giving it too much credit. This very average action scene was turned into one of the best climactic action scenes I have ever seen in a comic book movie, and definitely one of the most epic. And in the end, it feels like Batman brought this team together for a reason, and you can see his accomplishments with this lineup here. The movie was idiotically mandated a two hour runtime from the incompetent studio back in 2017, so Joss Whedon had a tough job ahead of him, I get that. But why would he waste his two hour runtime with pointless scenes and that damn Russian family, I will never know. All in all, when you see the Snyder Cut and then look back at the Whedon Cut, it's not even about anything, and the stakes are so minuscule in comparison. Even though the fate of the world is at stake in both movies, it just feels so much more important, epic, and terrifying in Snyder's version. It feels like there is a reason for this movie to exist, whereas the Whedon Cut feels like a complete waste of time and doesn't need to exist. It's time for the scores. Justice League gets a 1 out of 10, and Zack Snyder's Justice League gets a 9. This is honestly my favourite Zack Snyder movie. I feel like the problems I had with the prophecy dialogue in Man of Steel, the slow and imperfect storytelling in Batman vs Superman, it has all been fixed in Justice League. Even if you look at the stingers later on that Zack Snyder shot recently for this movie, the dialogue and the direction is also really well done. So you can really tell that Zack Snyder has learned from his previous movies, and it's because of that that I really want to see more of his Snyderverse. And I really hope that Warner Brothers get on this and make the Snyderverse the main selling point for HBO Max. Do you know what really shocks me? Is that Snyder's version of this movie was released in 2021. It was supposed to release four years ago in 2017, albeit a mandated two hour version of it. So despite having so much more comic book movies released within these four years, this stuff still takes us aback now. So imagine how much it would have blown us away back then in 2017. There are honestly so many scenes in this movie that are the best I've seen in any comic book film, and I really didn't expect that. The movie also had a lot of heart, and you can see the passion that Zack Snyder had for storytelling when watching this. Now yes, I still have some problems with the Snyder Cut. One is the song numbers. They went on for too long, and in some circumstances, they got really weird. The second problem is how this really great scene between Martha Kent and Lois Lane was ruined because it turns out that this wasn't really Martha. It was Martian Manhunter. This takes away from the great scene between Martha and Lois, and it also takes away from a later scene where Martha reunites with Clark. And yeah, as you can tell by the joke in this video, I hated the new Gladiator theme that accompanies Wonder Woman throughout like 90% of the movie. Also, the mid credit scenes were tacked on to the actual ending for the film, and that was a terrible placement. Aside from that though, this is the first Zack Snyder film where I don't have any major problems with it. The last few months have been a disappointing time for comic book content for me. Both Wonder Woman 1984 and WandaVision really disappointed me, and I never thought that it would take a Zack Snyder film to make me feel this happy. And it especially helped Wonder Woman's image after what 1984 did to her. Another sign of a great comic book movie is when it makes you want to pick up a comic book, and Zack Snyder's Justice League is the first comic book movie in a long time that has made me want to pick up a comic. Everything in the Snyder Cut was better. The story was better, the structure was better, the characters were better, the action was better, the music was better, the villains were better, even the jokes were much better. Every new addition that Joss Whedon shot and included was entirely pointless and worse in every conceivable way. When we look back at the Joss Whedon Justice League, it is embarrassing that this was the first Justice League movie that we got. But after watching Snyder's version, this is more than worthy of being the first Justice League movie that we get. Let's just hope that we get to have more on HBO Max. In the past, I've said that Zack Snyder's weakest quality as a filmmaker is storytelling. But aside from a couple of musical numbers, Zack Snyder has done a stellar job at telling the story for this movie. And if this is a sign of things to come, then I can't wait to see his future films as his biggest flaw has now been corrected.